morning. My name is uh, Dr. Reina Kostova, and I teach uh, in the English department. I'm here to introduce Griffin Limbrick, who um, recently graduated from JSU with a master's degree in English. Um, Griffin also has a degree uh, in English and journalism from Auburn. He has also taught English in the Gustav Korea. Uh, he's a creative writer primarily and uh, has written about uh, his travels in Ecuador. He's also currently applying for graduate schools in creative writing. But uh, Griffin today is going to talk about uh, the novel We by Evgeny Zamyatin. Um, and we talked about this novel in our contemporary European literature uh, course that I taught last spring. In this class, we mainly followed modernist and postmodernist uh, theories uh, and how they apply to contemporary novels. So Griffin is going to talk about um, we from uh, the perspective of uh, Jacques Derrida, who is one of the uh, most famous uh, deconstructionist thinkers of the 20th century. So here is Griffin. All right, let me adjust this a little bit higher. All right, this is going to be a bit of a 180 from, uh, I guess, we were just discussing here. But, uh, like Dr. Kostva said, this is a basically a science fiction novel uh, from the early 20th century. So, I'll go ahead and launch this and get started. So, many early 20th century science fiction writers were concerned with the implications of totalitarianism and what kind of dystopia these regimes would bring about uh, in the future and that kind of thing. None were more attuned to the influence of language, though, in totalitarian police states than Yevgeny Zamyatin, a Russian writer who composed his novel We in 1920. So his no novel kind of set the precedent for these other science fiction novels to come, like Orwell's 1984, uh, Huxley's Brave New World, etc. In the story, futuristic citizens live in an ideal society, a quote utopia, in which all architectural structures are glass, so that citizens may be seen at all times. So instead of 1984, when you have cameras, it's all glass society. And basically, every citizen performs a single function for the efficiency of society, similar to the way cogs operate in a machine. It's on a slide here. There we go. Okay. Uh, as demonstrated by the single pronoun title of the novel, the benefactor, who's the leader or the president of the one society, uh, of Zamantine's fictional and futuristic one state, bases his entire glass enclosed society on the idea that the many, we, are greater than the individual, I but only if they function with solidarity. With a unified population, the benefactor hopes to construct a perfect state that functions with mechanical efficiency, a state devoid of the rebellion or revolution that usually springs from individuality. What I'm attempting to outline in this presentation are the flaws in the linguistic and the idealistic logic of totalitarianism, demonstrating how ironically the benefactor's attempt to eliminate individuality by aligning the masses actually produces a more powerful, capable entity. The group is great only if it acts as an individual. In this way, the lowercase we state is no different from a giant uppercase I. Just as the individual, just as the pronouns I and we must both perform a singular action in a sentence, the like-minded group will function similarly to the individual, except on a larger scale, obviously, which makes it more efficient, but also way more vulnerable to attack and susceptible to massive failure. As the narrator of we, uh, D503, because citizens are given numbers, not names, they want to eliminate individuality completely here. So our narrator, D503, immediately establishes the one state as a unified society devoid of individualism. To use the word I is even a grammatical error, because, I is, because we is always the correct pronoun in the situation. As D503 writes, and I'm going to apologize for the natural amount of air quotes I'm going to use here, uh, quote, every morning with six wheel precision at the same hour and same moment, we, millions of us, get up as one. At the same hour, a million headed unison, we start work, and a million headed unison, we end it. End quote. The citizens basically function as appendages on the one state's giant singular body. The format of the novel, uh, the way D503 D writes about all this stuff, is out of a journal, so it's his day to day documentations. This form establishes a couple of things. One, the journal in this dystopian society is a public piece, more so than a private piece, as D503 represents not only himself, but the entire society. Uh, two, because it's a journal, a direct documentation, the undependable, undependable memory isn't allowed to interfere with the writing. The plot is recorded as it happens, not as it's to remember to have happened, like in most novels and other things. 
Uh, three, I said a couple, three. The words all come from D503. There's no second narrator who found the journal and introduces it in a story like Rick Van Winkle or something like that. So there's no real, the narrative's unified and there's no real division between voices. Yet in a work meant to document the success of a unified society and the perfect alignment of its people with the pronoun we, there will always be a problem inherent to the creative work itself, that is, the journal. The narrator of a journal, in this case D503, disrupts the perfect unity of society by employing the pronoun you, which he does often. The writing is not a diary, a therapeutic, a th a therapeutic uh, recording of personal tribulations day to day, but rather a sequence of journal entries intended to be written and read by the unknown, the capital O, other, someone else. And D503 is very much aware of his audience. The introduction of you into the one state society is the benefactor's fault, the leader's fault. Uh, he's having a society build, the society build a spaceship to explore other worlds and basically spread the gospel of the one state's unity, how perfect and coherent they are. Um, but, as the chief, and as the chief engineer, D503 is instructed to record the whole process in a journal. Uh, however, the spaceship is a flawed concept by the benefactor because basically exploration of foreign worlds is going to divert attention from the one state's synonymous I and we and place it instead on the pronouns you and they. So the recognition of this you pronoun outside of society is a catalyst for the recognition of other pronouns inside society. For differentiation, and thus it eventually catalyzes individuation. Along with this distinction between writer, I, we, and reader, you, comes with the awareness of the pronouns he, she, and they. Thus relocating the one state's entire center, and basically the entire ideology. Language can be as formulaic as math in many ways, and then certain rules of grammar and syntax must be upheld as constants for the rest of discourse to maintain its order. As philosopher Jacques Derrida writes about language in his essay, Structure, Sign, and Play in the Discourse of Human Sciences, here come the air quotes, quote, it was necessary to begin thinking that there was no center, that the center would not be thought in the form of a present being, that the center had no natural sight, that it was not a fixed locus, but a function, a sort of non-locus in which an infinite number of sign substitutions came into play. I'll slide this here. So basically, uh, this podium could be, just as well, be called a tree. And as long as everyone in this room agreed upon that word for, the, for this object here, then that'd be totally fine. We'd all understand each other, right? So the word itself doesn't really mean so much as what it, as what it signifies, which is the concept here. So um, basically, the recognition of you... Uh, sorry, I lost my place here. There I am. All right. Um, the podium, so just says there's no center to language, as just as you can substitute this kind of word for any, basically any kind of object whatsoever. There's also no center to the we-driven one state, because it's, it's, it revolves around this pronoun, this idea of we. So any pronoun may be substituted, including the pronoun he. And so the first he that D503 becomes aware of is in reference to the benefactor himself, the leader himself. When writing about the leader of the one state, D503 always refers to him with a capitalized he, the same way that a monotheist would refer to his God. Uh, by allowing himself to be equated in importance with the greater cause of the one state, the benefactor not only makes it yet another mistake by individuating himself from the masses, but he also draws attention to the instability of the linguistic system on which his state is founded, displaying that there is no true center for civilization. The center is supposedly we, but it could also be he, which proves that no center actually exists. The space is simply there as a non-locus, as it will always be filled with something. She is even eventually substituted when D503 is introduced to I330 and falls under the spell of her personality. Again, we have a number uh, with a letter here as a character. Uh, I330 is the most individ individualistic character in the novel, as implied by the now chosen for her name here, the pronoun, uh, who often rebels by drinking liquor, smoking cigarettes, and wearing pretty dresses, basic acts of hedonism in this kind of society. The acts of rebellion define her in opposition to the rest of the we society, thus evoking the pronoun she when being written about by D503. When discussing I330's mysterious individuality, D503 writes, quote, She seemed to speak somehow out of myself. She spoke my thoughts, but in her smile there was a constant irritating X. Behind the shade, something was going on within her, end quote. While D503 identifies with I330 as a human being, or maybe more accurately as a citizen of the one state, not really a human being, uh, 
The unknown quality that he speaks of, the unsolvable X, that's missing from her equation is I-330's individuality, her cultivation of she. E-503 genuflects to the power of I-330's adaptability, the strength of one who can separate herself from the masses, acknowledging, quote, she is stronger than I, I'm afraid I will do what she asks. And then this is my on that. Just as I-330, the individual, is stronger than D-503, the minion, the pronoun she holds more power than I, or it's equivalent in the one state, we. And perhaps it is this constant example of I-330 that leads D-503 to the discovery, finally to the discovery of himself, enabling him to extract he from we in a similar fashion. D-503's frequent encounters with I-330 eventually engender a certain self-reflection, something he labels as imagination, which is considered completely legal in the one state. Through this self-reflection, he begins to parse himself from the masses. As he writes later in the novel, when taking a stroll alone at the recommendation of his doctor, quote, everyone else was in, this, was in the auditoriums as prescribed by the table of hours, and only I was alone. It was essentially an unnatural sight. Imagine a human finger cut off from the hole, from the hand, a separate human finger running, stooped and bobbing, up and down along the glass pavement, end quote. So D503 has stepped outside of the one state, has shed his love for the whole by falling in love with the individual, uh, who is I-330. And by doing so, has become an anomaly, a detached finger roaming the streets while the rest of the hand continues to flex its muscles. The final recognition of a separate self for D503, however, comes in the form of literal reflection when he, uses, when he views his image in a mirrored surface uh, and subsequently identifies that image as a separate being, writing, quote, I look at myself, at him, and I know he, with his straight eyebrows, is a stranger, alien to me, someone I am meeting for the first time in my life, and I, the real I, am not he, uh, end quote. As D503 gradually uncovers you, uppercase he, she, and eventually lowercase he, uh, upon looking in the mirror, his pronoun discomfort places him on the verge of mental breakdown. He's unable to accept the, accept the fragmentation and randomness in his ordered centered life. Our documenter, the most loyal subject of the one state, begins to fall apart uh, emotionally and physically, to fragment, and just as design, the rest of the totalitarian civilization follows, destructing in perfect unison. Thanks. Any questions for me? Mm -hmm. And I'll explain the last slide here. Uh, so the Russian word for we is going to be on your left there, and you actually pronounce that me. Uh, so it's kind of a strange confusion of pronouns already, and just inherent in the title itself, between we and you there. Okay. Thanks so much.